motherfuckers always hating when you coming up. Steady watching how I move, but ain't no running up. Yeah, we sliding through that city with that drummy tuck. Trying to ride on my wave, tell them buckle it up. And I ain't got to check the bezel because my time is now. No rubber on this Glock because we pulling now. All this hey, yo, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day. Feeling blessed and like I always say, it's one life, one chance. When you got one chance to do this right, let's get it done. With that being said, another video, another topic, another prison story, just like you guys want. Appreciate the support about the video, what I did with about Bozo and addressing that certain issue. You know, you know, I, I guess I had to be the one to do it, but you know, I got a, I got a sense of pride of where I'm from, no matter what, no matter what position I'm in, no matter if people perceive it as. Well, I remember hearing a comment like, "Hey, bro, you're a dropout, so you lost that title." I mean, regardless, I'm the one that dropped it, so it doesn't matter. I'm addressing that food personally because I have a personal issue with it. So, as you can see behind me, you know, one of my subscribers did go on my Amazon wish list and bought me my studio equipment, so it's in the process of getting set up. I just gotta, I'm gonna try to set it up like a lounge so we can all lounge together and chop it up as I tell my stories, man. So, shout out to my subscriber, man. Thank you for the gift for my birthday, and I appreciate that. So, with that being said, Let's get into the video. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like. Always leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Check the links in the description for all my Apple Music, Spotify links, so on and so forth, and the Amazon wish list. Thank you. On another note, I work the day of my birthday, but I'm actually uh, having a birthday party the weekend of, so I'm going to be going live every day. And once I reach that 20, 20K mark, which you know has been very successful, and thank you guys for that. I plan on doing something. I'm trying to figure it out, like a some way to give back to the to those that have been watching my channel, man. I really do appreciate it. Now, there was an incident in prison where the Sureños that I was running dope with on the main lines, he got busted. And, you know, we were heating good, bro. My God, I, I was able to get my, uh, my primo rest in peace. I was able to get somebody that was uh, really close to him to come visit me and bring it in. And we would bring it in once a month, just, a, just but a big, I would bring a big load in. Bless the house, bless the familianos in the back, so on and so forth, make our money. But I didn't want to risk it. I didn't want to risk my main line. Everybody kept bringing in every week and getting busted. I was like, bro, I'm not trying to throw my life away like that. Not that easy, not for some crumbs. So the South Side I was bringing it in for, or the Sureño, matter of fact, he was from Anaheim, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, his name was Trippy. But uh, most of the time when I bring it in for him, you know, I would have to give him a big portion get my issue because I was literally paying half of what it cost to bring whatever it is he wanted to bring in. I was putting up my half, he'd put in his half, his old lady would bring it or cop it. The person that I was bringing it in would meet him somewhere down south, pick it up. So it was like a process. It was like a three-week process to bring it in, but none of the homies at the time really had it like that. And with the person that was bringing it in for me was more closer to where Anaheim was, which is a two-hour drive, because the only homeboy that could bring it in, that boy was way deep up north. Like, I don't know, I think it was San Francisco, and I was like a four or five-hour drive, so it was better to drive two hours than five hours. That was just my logic. Plus, it felt good to work hand-in-hand -hand with Sureños. You know, where, you know, he was willing to work with me, he was willing to help me out, but it was, still, it was still a tricky dance move. You know, it was still, you know, we were walking on glass pretty much. Like, man, anything goes wrong, bro, it's a war. You know what I mean? That's the risk that I had to take, though, because the Familianos were on my bumper. Like, bro, we need that money every month, regardless of the situation. So he gets busted. Now I'm looking at my cell like, hey, bro, I don't know what we're going to do for to generate revenue and production. Because part of the Norteño program, the Northern Structure program, our one of our ultimate goals is called revenue and production. We have to be productive in this facility. We got to make sure we make money off this facility, not only for the household, but for the Familianos. So I was under a lot of pressure, to be honest with you. So the bottom tier had a bunch of, uh, there was like five or six bloods, all from the same hood, all from bounty hunters. Now, I really can't recall a lot of their names, but my celly used to mess with them tough. We used to, I, I would mess with them tough. They were really cool people. One of them in particular, his name was Red from Bounty Hunters, but he was actually in another section. My celly was the Mac rep at the time, and he came back. He goes, hey, bro, I talked to Red, and uh, it just came up, bro. But that fool said he can supply it, and his girl can bring it up north. She'll bring it all north as long as he gets half. He's like, you ain't got to pay for nothing, none of that. All you got to do is bring it in, cut it in half, let him get his issue. I was like, cool. So my celly goes, hey, go ahead and get him on a piece of paper. So, you know, I pull out the yellow paper. 
you fold it from the bottom like three lines so you can mini write on it. So I mini write them. I was like, hey, bro, pretty much I just want to open a, a topic of discussion about bringing it, bringing it in, bro. My, my son says you can bring it. So tell me how you want to go about this. Uh, let's exchange contacts from the streets so we can get this going, get the ball rolling. So there's a lot of space on the paper. He writes, he uses that same paper and writes it back. He goes, all right, we could do this. We could do that. We could do that. Go ahead and shoot your number. And I have my people call you. So I looked at, that was my first sign. I was like, mm. like I, it could have been both ways. You could have slid me your number and I would have slid you mine in exchange. Just to build a trust relationship. You know, that way we understand that we're on the same page of communication when it comes to trusting one another. But he only asked me for my girl's phone number. So I was like, mm, I'm not going to give it to him just yet. I'm not going to give them to this yet. So I started asking some more questions on how we're going to go about this and what exactly they want to bring in and how much and does she know what she's doing? Because I'm not going to go out there and if she's bringing nothing but balloons, I'm not going to swallow balloons the size of chicken nuggets either. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to choke to death. And if she definitely don't know what she's doing and she just wraps it up like a ball and I'm over here, I'll visit and she hands it to me and I'm over here sw swallowing a, a, a ball breaker. I'll just give it right back to her because I don't even, I mean, yeah, I hooped the phone before and, and some other stuff, but that's a hard thing to put up your, 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 your rectal too. It would just been all bad, bro. Now they handed it right back to her, like, man, you can go somewhere with all that. Ain't nobody trying to swallow all that. I ain't the throw goat. I ain't Nicki Minaj, bro. I'm cool, bro. You can take that back. So he's telling me she knows what she's doing, that she's done it plenty of times. She knows how to wrap it, but it's, it's all going to be ballooned up, but it's all going to be wrapped in as one. I'm like, okay, okay. He shoots me the same kite back on the same piece of paper. So what do I do? I write it back and I respond. And I said, you know what? The only way this is going to work, man, I just got to trust him, man. My girl knows better than she'll tell me if this fool's old lady was trying to go get over on her or he was trying to get at her or so on. That's just a trust you got to do. That's why I'd rather deal with Sudanians because I think they were, they, the respect level was there and they know the possibilities of it going wrong. You know, so I shoot him my phone number. Bam. All good. Not even the same day. It was the next day we had yard in the morning. We go out there. And the Norteño program is this. We all go to our immediate area. Then you have the observation post. Then you had the uh, yard security. They're going to walk around with a couple of soldados. And they're going to check the yard. And Sad FC yard, it's, it's in the track. And everything's mostly on that side. We had this side where it was just a table. I don't know why the homies wanted it away from everybody. But regardless, we go. We check the poles, we kick the dirt a little bit, see if any uh, weapons are placed in our immediate area that we didn't know of. Check everything. You know, it's, it's called a perimeter check. We do it every yard that we're on. My Sally was a MAC rep at the time, and he was at a MAC rep meeting, and he was going, he went to the program office with the sergeant and all the MAC reps on the yard, which was like two Sudanios, two Northerners, two Blacks, two skinheads, two Asians that represent the others, the whole cart. And we went to yard like normal. Only problem is the yard security didn't see it, but as we're all walking, there's always going to be two groups of three walking the track the first 30 minutes, and they're going to be separated. Those are, the, those are our, our line of defense. They're going to be paying attention to every group segment. Everything that, they, everything that they notice that's unusual or suspect, they're going to alert the yard security in the observation post. Then they're going to uh, alert the yard channel, and then from there on, we'll activate a uh, half 60, full 60, and get prepared. That's pretty much how it works. One of them finds a kite, sees a bunch of mini riding on it. Everybody knows that when people are on the, on the tier route ride mini riding, it's only about two or three group segments that actually ride like that. The, the Africanos and, every, uh, and others, they'll just, ride, they'll just ride you regular, just on a piece of paper. Mini riding like bar for bar for bar within the, within the lines of a piece of paper, that's pretty much, that's pretty much the gang culture, it's the gang factions. So the homies find it. Read it as they're walking around the track to turn it in and realize that everything is talking about mine and his conversation. I'm like, what? So it gets delivered to the yard security and the yard security delivers it up the chain of command and it reaches my hands before yard recall. I read it and I'm like, no way. This is all our conversation. You know what's crazy is that I had our cell door numbers on it. Now, mind you, the last time I shot on the kite was on the tier after dinner to his cell. So it shouldn't have went anywhere but the toilet. Write my number down, throw the kite in the toilet. So how did it end up on the yard? What's he doing carrying it on the yard? So my Sally comes back. I'm chopping it up with them. I let him know about the breach of security, and he's freaking out. He's like, man, our cell number's on there. That, that, 
how do we know that, you know, the cops didn't see it and just left it there? Because the before yard program, the cops will walk around, look at our the southern area, the northern area, the blacks area. They'll look at certain areas that they feel like they know where Southsiders bury their weapons or uh, northerners bury their weapons. They'll go kick the dirt around. They'll go check things before they release the yard just to try to make it a secure environment. Like, how do we how do we know that the cops didn't actually look at it and see him like, oh, we're going to drop this down, take pictures, submit it, but we'll leave it there just to see what happens, just to see it kick off. You know, correctional officers are corrupt too, bro. Don't believe that. Me and my son, it kept bouncing ideas out like, hey, bro, what should we do, man? Should we just get off, bro? Was that a setup? Are they trying to get us off the yard? Is this fool trying to get me off the yard so he can have the pipeline to himself? He's just trying to get rid of me. And it didn't help that me and my son had sniffed some little pixie dust lines of, of, of methamphetamine. So we were now we're really going, our mind's going crazy. I, my, my mind had like a little hamster on a wheel, just I'm like, damn. My celly goes, hey, bro, we got to exercise diplomacy, bro. That's what diplomacy is there for, bro. Let's get at the bounty hunters. So we get at the porter that was actually passing the kites. And we're like, and so I go up to him. I'm like, hey, bro, I just want to ask you a personal question. This is a serious matter. I don't want to just leave this conversation. But uh, that kite I shot to your homie Red, did that make it there? And he was like, what you mean, blood, for real? Yeah, yeah I made it there. I'm the one that personally dropped it off. And I go, look, bro, I got the kite right here, bro. And we found it on the yard. I don't... It, our conversation was pretty much done. I don't know why, how it made it to the yard. Maybe he forgot about it in the sock, but who knows? But this cop was found on the yard, and my people found it, and the cops could have found it. And look what it's talking about. So he's reading it. He's unaware of our conversation. And he was like, well, you serious? And I was like, yeah, bro, we found it, and we're submitting it to you guys, man. I, obviously, I crossed my girl's number out. I go, look, this, we want something done about this, bro. That, that was a breach of security. Now our, our cell's alerted. Now my homies know our business now. People, a lot of people could have found that kind, left it there, and now they know about our business. You know, we both can be getting snitched on and taken to the hole for that. So you know that this dude put my family's life in jeopardy and my life in jeopardy with catching a possible case because he he clumsy, fumbled the ball in the yard. He goes, hold on real quick, let me let me check something out. Let me, you mind if I let the homies check this out? And I was like, yeah, go ahead, bro, because it's not gonna happen anyways. What they do is he goes downstairs to the bottom tier, all the bounty hunter bloods, and he tells them the whole situation. They tell him, hey, ask, go, li, li, they wrote him a kite because they wanted to make sure it was the same handwriting that we weren't trying to set up red. So they write him some random kite, red writes back. They compare the notes and say, hey, man, it's red's handwriting. And plus red wrote with the red pen, so it kind of solidified the red print. The red print. They come up to us and they were like, yeah, bro, we wrote him a kite. We just wanted to, we just wanted to make sure, man, we had to do our investigation to make sure that this was actually red's handwriting. And it is. They go up to his door, chop it up with them, and they were like, hey, and they, they finessed it good. They were like, hey, bro, the, the blood homie over here, the, the North Days, they wanted to know if uh, you managed to get the number off the kite before you flushed it. He goes, yeah, man, I flushed it last night. I got, the, I got the number. It's already sent out. Let them know it's all good. The number's sent out to the streets. So they come back, and they're like, man, this blood just lied to us. He said he flushed the kite. And I was like, well, there's the kite right there, my boy. And I don't know what he did, what his intentions are. But that kite made it to the yard, bro. We want to see, we want to know what can be done about this. You know, we were like subliminally suggesting, like either knock him down, do something, discipline him. But you know, he, you know, you, we all could have won. We all could have brought it in. But that pipeline shut down. I'm not jeopardizing my family. I'm not risking nothing for somebody that's kind of clumsy. So all they said was, you know, something's gonna be done. They're gonna look into it. I don't know. I don't know what they talked. I don't know how they reached this conclusion. But they didn't notify us what was going to happen. We were just kind of just sitting there twiddling our thumbs, you know, just wiggling our tails. We go to yard one day, and it's early in the morning. It's cold. I'm out there with a jacket, my beanie, gloves, a bonnet on my face. That's how cold it was. And for everybody who knows, fighting in the cold sucks. You can, it, you're, you can feel everything. You can feel when your face gets swollen. You can feel that punch a little bit more and it stings a little bit more. And then your hands are red and they're throbbing because it's cold. And you probably have arthritis in your fingers from meaning writing all day. And Xeroxing on behalf of the homies. Oh, that's just me. We're chilling. And I see, it, it, dude, it was so obvious. But it's because if you know what to look for. You'll know when the the yard gets tense. You know when you start seeing groups separate. You start seeing you watching people's behavior and their demeanor change. I look to my right and there's a wall next to our observation table, our observation post, and I see about three or four of the bounty hunter bloods right there, and they're just like pulling their gloves back, stretching out their legs, 
I ain't never seen these guys work out in this area. This area is just a general blank area. Everybody's on the other side of the yard busting down on the blacktop or the pull-up bars. Nobody uses this area. So I'm looking and I tell my yard security, hey, man, go go roof as fast as you can. Go tell everybody half 60, bro. Get their bangers out, bro. Because I'm, I'm, now I'm thinking like, man, they might rush us thinking that we're trying to get their homie messed up. So the homie moves as fast as he can and I, it's... It, that's, it became more obvious because all you see is the homies just doing pull-ups, laughing, like, huh? Boom. And you, all of a sudden, you see all the Nolaners on the yard in groups of two and groups of three, like this. Yard got tense and quiet real quick. Then you see the Southsiders playing handball. Then you see them all turn around, gather up by the handballs in the, in the, in the bathroom area in the pull-up and just start facing our direction. And it looks like we're facing their direction. But quiet. Quiet, bro. You can hear the wind blow. I think that's. I think that yard was so quiet and so tense. I think the yard bugs actually grouped up and huddled up. I'm like, man, what the hell's going on, bro? What's good, bro? What's kicking off, bro? Let me know so I can give. So I can call them to my hole. I ain't trying to get sprayed. And his funny thing is that Red was walking with a uh, gray sweats. He had white shoes and he had no shirt on. And he was walking next to the porter that was the bounty hunter blood that actually did the whole investigation thing. And he's they're chopping it up, having a great conversation. Red's oblivious. To what's going on and how the yard looks. And they walk past us and we're looking. And they're, and they're going towards that group right there. We're still watching. And then he, as soon as he got like halfway past the group. Bam. One of them grabs him from the back of the neck. Puts him in a chokehold. And they just start jumping him. Mauling him. Bad. Beating on him. And it, it, honestly, you heard every kick. Every punch. Every <coughs> blood. Uh, uh, damn, come on, man, what, what's going on, man, well, what was cool about this one, and like, I've seen a lot of fights and a lot of removals in prison, what was cool about this one, it's like, they weren't stepping all over each other, they weren't getting in each other's way, they weren't stopping, it was like, one dude was like, two or three punches, backed up, the other one, two or three punches, backed up, the other one jumped up from behind, and so Red's, that dude couldn't take down Red by choking him and falling backwards, so what they did was Red tried to turn around to book it. And I just see two, two bloods grab both legs and just pull backwards. And you see Red fall forward. Bam! And then, oh my God, bro. It was like a, it was like a deadly game of rugby slash soccer. All you see is that fool's head go boop, 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 boop. But there was one kick where that dude kicked him so hard that he was face was laying down like this. And it just slid on the gravel. And I see that fool's face go, mm, bam, and lay. And you just see it all just go. Rah. You see him leaking bad. He got knocked out. They still continue to kick while the cops are running over there. I seen him wake up for three seconds, look, get kicked again, close his eyes and lay back down. And then when the cops got close enough before they could spray, everybody got down. They, they, they checked everybody, escorted everybody. Man, the whole bounty hunter car got on this dude. I was like, man, you, you, a 201 would have been suffice. You know, I, could, I would have been accepting of that or just a quick discipline, you know, punch him in the face a few times and let him, let him do burpees and jumping jacks in front of me and I could watch it. I would have been, that would have been cool. But, you know, like I said, black politics are a little different. If they all discuss it with the blacks and that's how they wanted to go, like, hey, man, bounty hunters, that's your people, man. Take care of your car, handle your business. They did that out of sign of respect, and I respected it for that. Even though I lost another connect, I didn't wind up getting one until like maybe two months later, and I started bringing it in pretty good. Red never came back to the yard. We talked to the bounty hunters, and they were like, hey, bro, you know, the homie can't be that clumsy. If it was something different, if it wasn't that serious, yeah, we wouldn't have had to do that, but that was serious, bro. There was a lot of, there was a lot of foul talk on that kite, bro, that would have gotten to the wrong hands, bro. We all could have been busted. And he's like, some of my brothers downstairs got claps. You know, we got things, too. We got a lot of things going on for him to be risking it like that. If he's going to be that clumsy, we can't trust him. So we were at the door like, that's what's up, man. And then we busted a unity spread with them for looking out for us and helping us out. And then one of, one of the that, – that, that brought us even closer than one of his boys named Slim. He was some bounty hunter. He used to come in our cell, and he used, we used to get that boy geeked off tweet. He'd give us like $200 of green dots, and we'd give that boy like four fat gaggers. And then I would tat on, I tatted like I tatted on his chest, I tatted on his neck, I tatted on the back of his neck. 
dude was a cool dude, and they, they ended up being cool with us at the end, so that's my story about how it almost kicked off with the Bounty Hunter Bloods from, from Los Angeles, I think that's where they're from, right, they should, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're from Los Angeles, damn near was on a full 60, about to go to war, for the most dumbest reason possible, because a man decided to either drop a kite on the, on the yard, and forget that he even had it on him in the first place, which I doubt, or he probably tried to set us up, man, try to get his woot wop, so that way he could take over or just get rid of us altogether. But, wanted to share that with you guys. That was one of my crazy experiences when it comes to the main line. Where we almost, like, I kicked it off with the blacks in Susanville. I kicked it off with Southerners and Skinheads. So this would have just been another day in paradise. But that would have been a rough one, man. Because I ain't gonna lie to you. Every single one of these Bounty Hunter Bloods was built for tough. I'll tell you that much. And then my homies, you know, we do our burpees, bro. But a lot of my homies were skinny, sucked up, bony. It would have been a wonderful melee. I ain't going to lie. It would have been fun. We were more deeper than them. We were 30 deep, and they were like maybe 7 or 8. But still, though, power in numbers. So with that being said, hope you guys like my war story. Be back soon with some more. With that being said, with that being said, like I always say, it's one live, one chance. When you got one chance to do this right, let's get it done. Peace.